comments? Like Mark saying, can you invite me back in? Yes. Yeah, just trying to see how I'm um, inviting back in. Here we go. Yeah. So Mark's on. He was, he was here out. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here he comes. Mark. My God, this is too much for my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I here think we go. Here that comes Tufi. Here comes Tufi, I think. Is he coming? Uh, he wants the mic, but how can I yeah, get to him? Yeah, I gave him the mic. I don't know if I messed something up, but now he's gone. <laughs> yeah, so we're good to start about now. Let's give another minute. So I'm not quite, quite sure if I can see anyone who's in the session. Yeah, I think there's, I think it's just two feet in the waiting room. Well, me and two feet in the waiting room, but I'm here as well. Hmm. Yeah, we're seeing him as a visitor. So he says he's going to try another profile. Okay. How did you pass him the mic the last time, Trista? You get a little alert and it, you just, it says, Tufi's asking you, yes, yeah, can you see him now? There we go. So maybe, yeah, maybe Mark, if you can, or Sean, if you can buy. Yeah, what I'll do, oh. oh. I won't touch anything. There we go. There we go. Here he comes. Just as well, we're not on the technology panel. I know, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, technology is everywhere now, right? Yes. Especially in capitalism, post-COVID. Yes. Yes, absolutely. He's not coming. I don't know. Now he wants it again. Try him so again. So him. Hopefully this comes in. Here there he goes. goes. Yeah. Hello. Hey, Hello. How are you? Hello. I had to sign out and sign back in with five different profiles. So here I am. I'm here. <laughs> Okay, so I think we've started. I think we're pretty much a minute or two into this session commencement. So, um, and we're now recording. So we'll get underway. I, mean, see, I can't quite see who's joined the session from outside our panel. Um, can't see that list, but I guess we'll just sort of kick along. If everyone agrees with that, everyone how are you happy to start? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay, great. So um, welcome, everyone. Mm -hmm. This is... Um, Horasis USA session call Sustainable Capitalism Post-COVID. And I've got an amazing array of um, panelist speakers who are joining me today. My name's Sean Devis. I'm chairing this session. Uh, joining me is uh, Trista Bridges, Tufi Saliba. Ify, uh, Ify Yakala was to join us, but she may join us later. Uh, Mark Simon and Marie Dufacord. So welcome, everyone. This is going to be a really interesting discussion, um, given you know, great timing as well, I think, given what's happening geopolitically as well, not just post-COVID. So um, we've got about 30 minutes we'll probably discuss, actually 45 minutes for the whole session in total. We'll try and leave maybe 10 or so minutes for a bit of Q&A if there's any questions that come into the panel. I'll try to keep an, an eye on it and see how we go. So um, just before we start, um, I realise that any sort of serious discussion, I think, and needs to have that sort of touch of lightheartedness. And given this is a racist USA, um, I'm a born and bred Australian. Uh, we've got people from Japan here and, uh, and for USA as well. But uh, and being Australian, we, we are born naturally with a love of all sports. I do love my baseball, and it's where I declare my love for the Boston Red Sox. So there we go. Welcome, everyone. Great to see you. So here we go. So um, enough about me. Trista, if I can ask you the first question. Um, as you know, our session topic is sustainable capitalism post-COVID. Um, it reminds me of a, um, a comment by one of our emerging thinkers of our time from Ziordan Sadar, who says that we're in post-normal times where... Um, there's an in-between period where old orthodoxies are dying, new ones are to emerge, and nothing really makes sense anymore. So I'd be interested to know uh, from you, in terms of capitalism, where do you think that orthodoxy is dying? What is emerging for capitalism? And what do you see making sense capitalism going forward post-COVID? Okay, before I answer the question, which is you know somewhat of a serious one, I will say, I'll forgive you for the Boston Red Sox cap. <laughs> I'm originally from South Jersey, and we're Phillies fans, so we don't really... <laughs> Love the socks down in Philadelphia. But in any event, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, it's, it's absolutely fine. We love our teams. So um, 
Goodness. I mean, I think that, you know, in terms of capitalism, so many things have been upended in recent years. Um, and I think if you got to look at this period of time, it's really a very tough one, right? Um, but I think if you put it in historical perspective, you know, you go through these transitions that are turbulent and problematic at, at times. And capitalism clearly um, was a, or has been for the last, you know, I guess 100 years or so, a very, very healthy, helpful system to kind of help our societies develop and get to a certain stage. However, I think what we've seen is that, you know, it's creaking quite a bit. Um, people are being left out of the system. There's too much um, income disparity within Western societies that are supposed to offer this kind of model for a better life. If we don't have a significant amount of our people who are able to be a part of this, that's a real problem. And that's basically, you know, what's going on. And so um, some things that um, are not really, I think at the moment, very workable for capitalism and, and help it not be as fit for purpose as it needs to be is first of all, I'd say our perspective. You know, capitalism in recent years has taken a very short term perspective on dealing with, mm. with problems. Even if you look at the valuation of a company, it really kind of depends on what happens one quarter to the next. And that's not really the best way to kind of look at kind of value over time, to look at development over time, mm -hmm. to look at the health of a society over the, over time. So I think we need to readjust our perspective for even stock trades. For example, I think I was reading, when I was writing my book, I was researching and apparently um, stocks used to be held for several years, five years. The average stock was held for five years back in the 50s. Now it's something like eight months. Um, so mm -hmm. I, think that, and I think that's just showing you one area where you know we have some issues. Secondly, I think you know what is the purpose of an organization or a corporation? Um, these companies that are underpinning um, capitalism, um, the purpose has been for many years just to kind of maximize profits. And what we're seeing over time is that this orthodoxy is shifting, and people are thinking of that as you know not the best idea. You know, companies need to be more expansive in terms of thinking about their impact on society, um, dealing with ge little geopolitical shifts like we've seen certainly in the last couple of weeks with this war how quickly companies have made decisions to pull out um, of Russia, which means that, you know, companies can make decisions quickly and can change if they want, or if they have, you know, or if there's a, something compelling them to. Um, so I think we can be, they can be more choiceful and a bit better about how they um, make decisions, how they think about risk and how they think about, you know, society and their impact on it as a whole. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I, I welcome any other sort of further comments around that question from the panel. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think there's no doubt capitalism needs to reshape itself and a new vision for that. You mentioned the short-termism. I think that's a real major issue. Um, as you know, capitalism has that element of private control, private interest. That needs to change. And I think you've touched on that uh, perfectly, Trista. So if there's any other sort of further comments from the panel, um, where do you see capitalism going from here? Maybe we can yeah, chuck just, to you, Tithi. Just, just, just to jump on on what uh, you, you, you both were saying and Trista was saying that Definitely, I think for, for modern companies now, uh, it's, it's a key question to, uh, to ask uh, about what, what is their purpose. And definitely, as, as you were saying, Krista, it's not anymore just about, you know, how to make the best and most important profit for shareholders. And I think now it's much more for all of them to care about all of their um, stakeholders, you know, not just shareholders, but all of the stakeholders and how do they um, demonstrate that they contribute to, um, you know, something good for all of the, these communities around. So it's, 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 it's a whole new uh, kind of uh, purpose for companies, definitely. Yeah. Um, look, if I can check to you, Tufi, um, you work in a really interesting space um, in technology, um, particularly if, if, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, artificial intelligence. Um, that there's a lot of words coming, a lot of, um, I guess, thoughts coming out now that the, the technology that's coming out now is going to shape the next 100 years, just like hydrocarbons did with aviation and cars. And, and so we're sort of in a similar sort of situation now and, you know, with artificial intelligence, uh, Internet of Things, augmented reality. I'll be really interested to hear your perspective on how, you think technology itself will shape capitalism uh, going forward for the next? And do you agree with that that fifty to hundred year sort of thought and framework? First, let me tell you, it's very rare that I'm on a panel and I agree with others, but I seem to agree a lot with what Marie said and Trista said a lot. So I, I won't uh, cause an argument here or a debate. Uh, and it's very rare. You actually have a track record. You can find me online. I always. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
absolutely what Trista said that it, it served it, 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 its its purpose and what uh, Ma uh, Marie alluded to that there needs to be additional responsibility for the for the entire stakeholders, not shareholders. Where, where uh, AI comes in, you know, which is pretty much more where my expertise is, is uh, securing AI and not just AI. There are a lot of other experts that are way better than me in AI itself. Uh, I specialize in securing AI itself from being repurposed against uh, uh, against the host by the people they're managing it. And with that, I currently uh, chair uh, the uh, the IEEE Global Chair for the International Protocols for AI Security. But in the same time, I see things from uh, from where the technology is heading that a lot of uh, folks don't necessarily see it. So from the IEEE perspective, I'm there to build things to protect people. And it's like a $2 billion initiative. It's all my give back to society. I don't, you know, this is, but in parallel to that, for my, my business, one of the things that I'm heading is called hypercycle. And the reason why I'm telling you that is to get to answer your question. What hypercycle is, is basically a marketplace for AI engines to work kind of similar in advanced, uh, you know, capitalism, if you wish. Or, or, or when AI talks to another AI engine, it doesn't necessarily just talk information. It talks value because it can subcontract another engine in a sub-second, sub-pennies, and so on and so forth. The, the protocol to run this is what we're calling it hypercycle, basically the marketplace for many AI engines. Now, if you look forward into the future of what could come out of all of that, having, let's say, 40,000 engines you can access by, by picking up your phone and calling to a bot. When you're talking to a bot, you're actually talking to 40,000 engines as opposed to mm -hmm. talking to a single company. Now, that, of course, they're talking value to each other, but the danger in that, if it's not done properly with security, it can be used in a way that the users that they're getting to depend on those AI, those same users that we call them the host, they, they are the target for whoever is running the AI to repurpose it. So it could be used today to give you a certain service, but tomorrow it can be repurposed to, you know, get you into some uh, problems or terrific, terrible things that you wouldn't even know. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give you an example that's happening right now in the world, okay? One of the unintended consequences of artificial intelligence caused the biggest bifurcation in human history. Today, it's happened right now. If you, any one of you, and I'm sure many of you, would have very close friends, they're extremely smart, but they are either vaxxer or anti-vaxxer, for example, okay? <laughs> very, very intelligent. You'd be, what happened? Well, if you're feeding the host, with the information that they're driven by the click machine, it's more like the carrot for the AI is that click. It wants you to click. It doesn't really care about other things, but it's got methods way more intelligent than any one of us combined. Okay? And it's just the methods to get you to click. It's just the, the, it, it's looking at a lot of the patterns and so on and so forth. You wouldn't even imagine of why you're actually clicking on a specific PhD or doctor who did some research in a specific thing, and you get to convince yourself more and more whichever direction that you have taken. So the, at, at the end of the day, people, they're not going to agree that they've been um, the, like, the, like the frog in the boiling water. Mm -hmm. You won't know. But the danger can be drastic. And I'm hoping that as a society, we build the proper measures so that uh, it cannot be repurposed, so that it can protect a lot of generations to come. So from that perspective, would cap capitalism help? help? Absolutely, because the actual engines that they're used to talk to each other, they are talking value, and you can measure that a lot faster. But at the same time, if you keep that carrot is the only driver, it will go in the wrong direction. So there needs mm -hmm. to be things done in by design right now before we get to that point. We won't be able to stop it at that point. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. So are you saying or suggesting that capitalism's role and, and the I guess the actors or agents in it have an important role to play to mitigate unintended consequences and set up the the rules of the game in that sense? Is that so? They talk about Moore's law and technology getting away from us in some way, and then we, we can't almost assess our unintended consequences until they almost in some sort of way we realise them. So um, I'd be interested to know who, who who's who's playing that role of, of enacting the, of I guess setting the rules of the game. Um, so we so we, we give them, I guess, a left and right of arc, so to speak, about so we know where technology can and can't go, so to speak, if you, if you sort of follow what I mean. Um, well, well I, I, I'm, well, I just want to point out something here, that uh, the simplistic way that we actually see it, we think that we are managing it down the road, and we think, hey, well, we're, we're you know, you're, you're Verizon, for example, in the United States, you think, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to use it against the people. I'm a good person. Why would I? I am the CTO of Verizon, okay? But the actual events that they would happen that would get you to not only profit things, sometimes they could be called ethical things. And I gave that mm -hmm. example a couple of years ago. Let's say the mayor of Los Angeles would give you a call. It would be like, the suicide rate went up in Los Angeles. Can you do something to reduce it? And it sounds like you're doing something super duper ethical. Okay, can we repurpose that machine that people use to go to sleep? Okay, mm -hmm. you use the app to help you to go to sleep. And you bring a bunch of researchers and be like, oh, yeah, we can. If you, if, 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 well, by comparing a lot of the people who committed suicide, we've noticed this kind of pattern in their sleep. But if we inject certain sound or whatnot, it will reduce the suicide rate. Okay, it sounds like phenomenal, ethical, great. But remember, the users, they never really ask you for it. You're repurposing it. But by mm. repurposing it that way, you can take it to the next level where you can actually stop suicide completely. Now, imagine you live in a world where you cannot kill yourself. Okay, so they just, I'm just saying like how certain things, they might sound really ethical, but repurposing can get you to a yeah. point where maybe this is dystopia and not necessarily utopia. Yeah. Uh, um, Mark, if I can only come to you, um, you were doing some... I don't want anybody to kill themselves. <laughs> Not at all. I'm just saying that the ability is uh, something that we, we use it to our advantage. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally hear what you're saying, mate. Um, uh, and Mark, if I come to you now, it's probably a good segue, but your, I guess your passion's in social impact um, with a background in hospitality and um, certainly interested to hear your view on how you see the current version of capitalism and how it could be either deserving or serving our, I guess our social and cultural systems going forward and, and what maybe a new version of capitalism needs to emerge to prioritise these aspects and how to support systemic resilience. So, uh, so again, that, that social impact side of things, um, how can capitalism I guess, emerge and find that new norm in itself and, and to support social systems? And uh, given again, through we've gone through a global pandemic, currently going through a geopolitical situation right now, um, what, what needs to emerge out of capitalism to embolden our social systems? Yeah, thanks, Sean, and thanks for for leading us forward. Um, no comments on the, the baseball cap. Um, so I think, I mean, I look at, I've been in hospitality 30 years on three different continents, and it seems like uh, doing the same thing that we've done. There, there are structures in place that I see in hotels today that I experienced 30 years ago. Um, and I think... I read on your website, we're deploying 20th century business models to confront 21st century problems. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's broken. And when are we going to wake up to, to, to this? And I think hospitality has this, uh, it, it's, it's a perfect marketplace for, for relooking at the business model um, with a focus being on social and environmental change as a forefront of making decisions. You know, we've got food and drink, we've got people, we build things we impact communities, travel. I think over 10% of the world population work in tourism and travel around the mm. world. So, I mean, it's, a, it's this huge opportunity. And I think that the, 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 the next generations are demanding it. So I think it's going in that direction, which is a very positive thing. I think people are, you know, I, I grew up in Kenya and people, are, people go on safari a lot more people go on safari 
wanting to know where the money's going. They want to mm. visit the clinic or they want to see the, the conservation things that are happening yeah. if I spend, you know, the $500 on, on, on that camp. Um, so I think, I think, you know, there are, there are amazing places in Africa, certainly in the, in the tourism space that are doing really well. I think, you know, hotels, hospitality uh, businesses need to look at hiring. You know, you, you have a, a Western brand often comes into a, into a, a market and you'll find um, the five C-suite people None of them are local. They're all expat, and they're making more than ninety percent of the workforce. So, so mm-hmm. let's look at, let's look at the workforce. Let's look at making sure that uh, the the vendors we hire, the food and beverages, local, organic, and sustainable. Um, I, I worked uh, on this private members club in London called the Conduit, and it was a membership model. So we could we we could really look at the the demographics, the ethnic diversity. The gender diversity of our, our membership. The same with our with our teams as well. We partnered with um, social enterprise. There's an amazing social enterprise in England called Brigade that takes formerly homeless people, trains them in kitchens, and then a place like the Conduit comes and hires them. I think the way we build build things, we have to look environmentally sustainably. And I'm sure my dogs are about to bark, so I apologize in advance. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I'll just leave you with, with one other thing, because I think your question about systemic resilience. So mm-hmm. I, I, I sit on a board of this conservation charity in Kenya, and it came about through tourism. So the guy built a camp, and the tourism revenue helped to start this conservation organization. And through working with the local Maasai people, um, they understood that the more wildlife there was uh, in the area, the more tourists would come because people were coming for the wildlife, obviously. And a rite of passage for the Maasai was was killing lions to show who's the, the manliest guy. And this organization had taken the a new age set of Maasais and trained them trained them to to protect the the the, the lions. And this is generations of Maasais that as a rite of passage we go kill a lion. And now they understood because they were part of this new capitalism, this new new hospitality capitalism that impacted the, the community so profoundly, they were the protectors of the lions. And then there was more employment in the camps. There were more tourists coming in. So I think I think looking at, at all these different aspects as, as a new capitalism for hospitality is, is definitely the way to go. Uh, that's, that's fascinating. Um... Yeah, uh, and this is probably where I can probably lead to Marie in a lot of ways. You know, we've all sort of mentioned values now. Um, uh, you mentioned up before too for you as well. Um, and Marie, you work in a very sort of interesting space in helping brands build value or, or that, you know, that um, and ethics. And then Tufi mentioned it before as well. Um, as I mentioned before, capitalism is essentially about, if you look at the definition, about private interest, private control. So for capitalism to move forward, how, how are brands in, in that space needing to shift to make the necessary changes. And if they're going to be the controlling this, what sort of shift do they need to make to get the ethics, the right um, this balance between the wanting growth but doing it ethically, doing it sustainably? Uh, how are you working with brands to guess, market that, position themselves in the right way? As we know, the you know, merging needs, changing needs, they're happening exponentially. So maybe give me a bit of a background in that space and how you're working to help brands I guess, posture capitalism in a whole new way. Mm. Uh, there's a lot to say, but um, but I think for sure, you know, brands have understood now that their consumers are expecting from them more than just, um, again, making making profit and selling goods. Um, and, and if, you know, a brand according to all of the surveys and studies and um, all of, you know, what they can read even on their digital platforms and social media and everything, they've understood that if they want to survive, it's, it's, it's not even, a, you know, um, it's not even a, like they need to be able to, uh, to offer more than just making profit. And you have tons of uh, 
figures, uh, you know, showing especially from the young generations uh, how, um, again, they expect much more from, from, from brands than just, uh, you know, what used to be expected, like maybe years ago. And, and definitely, um, as I think we have all been observing, it, it's, it's been accelerating with COVID, um, mm. definitely. And, and, um, and I was very interested in what Mark was saying, because I think one of the, one of the answer, uh, is clearly to be smart enough to build up collaborations and to build up collaborations with your peers, uh, peers, I mean, you know, even in similar, um, in similar industries. Like I've been working for, for 10 years in, in the jewelry industry, high end jewelry industry a while ago. And, and at some point, you know, we've understood that we would be stronger together. So when it was about, you know, like the blue diamonds issues, for instance, or such, like we've understood like getting together and, and building together, you know, better process and, and communicating together and, 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 and being able to offer better offer, I mean, better uh, answers to our customers together. Um, would be smarter than just, you know, considering each other as competitors and, and, and behaving, um, individually. And what, what I, what probably we are all observing now, it's beyond even, you know, similar industries. I think there's been an understanding that the private sector should work together with the public sector and should mm -hmm. work together with the public society. Like it has to be, um, if we want to be efficient and if we really want to build a better world, there's no other option than, you know, going together and, and growing together and, and, and improving together. And, 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 and it all goes, you know, with, with each other anyway. Like policy makers are going to make changes if they, you know, understand from um, the business leaders uh, where things are going. And the business leaders are going to be driven by... Uh, the the public you know and the consumers and the and the and the regular public so so again it's it it makes sense but i'm hopeful that you know there's been now this understanding that collaboration and alliances and 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 again you know um improving together is the only way to be efficient and that's really interesting, actually, because um, Tristan, one more maybe swinging back to you, and, and maybe Mark coming in on what Maurice also said in regards to that that swapping of business cards between the social aspects and, and private, and, and maybe how that, that could maybe uh, certainly benefit each other, where there can be a win-win there. But Trista, you work with boards and in, in sort of you know, improving, I guess, their sustainability literacy. Um, are you seeing, and we know that boards in some sort, I guess, almost the, you could say that the the, um, the mantle of, I guess, capitalism, that the corporation and the board sit at the, at the top of that. They're, they're, they're an important aspect of, I guess, capitalism going forward. You know, they almost hold it in their hands in some way. So how are, are you seeing the necessary shift in boards that, that supports that capitalism movement to being sustainable in itself? Is, is a board doing enough in terms of, a listening and, and acting and getting that diversity in to, and that skill set into boards. You know, just some comments there, if you, if you don't mind, because I sure. think that's that's going to be critical. Sure. Yeah, I actually uh, wrote an article about wrote an article about this and actually spoke on a podcast about this the other day. So, um, if you kind of look at the research that's been done with boards in recent years, um, the interesting thing is there's a real awareness about these issues, right? And I, th I think that they're you know certainly aware of them. However, their comfort level with them their capability with them is still quite low, right? And, and it makes sense because people on boards now did not come into business at a time where people learned about some of the things that Marie was talking about. You know, if you look at the relationship between NGOs and corporations, you know, over the last, you know, 40 years, it's not been a very good one. You know, to be you know either it's the company, you know, somebody in the company likes a charity or likes an NGO and just gives money without any kind of real strategic direction or, you know, they're influencing activist investors and there's, you know, it was really an, an, kind of an adversarial relationship at points. Yeah. So, you know, so I think that's the issue is that I think a lot of the people on the board are just not particularly capable at solutions for dealing with many of the issues that we're discussing. Right. You know, their comfort level is in a system that was functioning um, in kind of the more pure 
capitalist form, you know, perhaps of the 80s or the 90s. Um, but yeah, you know, we need to really imp improve, as I call it, the savviness of, of our boards around the topic of sustainability. Uh, on the diversity issue, one of the things that we are seeing is we're seeing um, stock exchanges, putting in place requirements um, that boards need to have, particularly in the United States. This is coming in to NASDAQ. In Europe, certainly, um, in, even in Asian exchanges, we're starting to see this around having a certain level of diversity on the board, either um, it be women or underrepresented uh, minorities and others um, on the board. So we are seeing real push to change the board. And there's all kinds of evidence that having more diverse boards tends to get better outcomes, just like having more mm -hmm. employee bases get better outcomes. So I think that's being more commonly accepted. But certainly, yes, things on do we understand the risks in our, our, our um, supply chains that are going to have a negative impact on communities and or climate change? No, I don't think most boards are able yeah. to articulate that yet, right? In 20 years, this will look completely different, right? Um, I, or 30 mm -hmm. years now, but unfortunately we don't have the time for that. So we need to think of solutions to get senior people in organizations, people who are decision makers up to speed on these issues really quickly. So things like having sustainability training within board training, um, really important to task people who are recruiting people for boards, to look for people with experiences, such as the people who are on this, on this panel today uh, is incredibly important. So I think there are things we can do to kind of shift that, but yes, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, so can I add to that and then ask Maria another mm -hmm. question? Um, I, I think I totally agree with, with what you say, Trista, the, the concern that, that I have with boards, and, and again, just based on my experience, is a, a, lot of, a lot of the investors will get a seat on the board. And so certainly in, in some of the, the organizations I've been part of, the investors are middle-aged white men. And so you've got, mm. you know, the, the A round, B round, C round, white guy, white guy, white guy, but I, I do agree. I think certainly in this country, there's a lot more uh, there's a lot more dedication to, to to more diversity, and and I think that's obviously the the best way that we will make 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 those decisions. Um, but I just wanted to go back to to what you said, Marie, and and it was sparked by one of my three daughters who grew up in New York City. So you can imagine, you know, 18, 20, 22 year old young New Yorkers who spend, when they're not on a device, they're thrifting. And it, it was such an interesting concept that these kids, all they're buying is secondhand clothes. You know, they mm -hmm. obviously they don't have the money to go into a, a, a quartier or a, or a whatever. But, but I'm just curious, with, with the younger generation that is doing secondhand purchasing of, of, of fashion, um, mm -hmm where this comes up with the brands that you work with, the high-end retail fashion brands, uh, is is there a consciousness about that, an awareness about that, that this sort of anti-capitalism, this young generation, that we're not going to shop in these, you know, these these big, big brand stores and they're going to get things second, third or fourth hand? Yeah, I was very striked. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago. I went to um, to George Washington University to do a lecture in, in a sustainable fashion class. And, you know, I, I was trying to make it a, a conversation. So I was asking a lot of questions to the, to the students, you know, taking advantage of uh, being there to, to get insights. And so it's, they are part of a business, you know, business um, like year. And, and, and this was a sustainable fashion class. So I was expecting people and I was ex expecting students with the ambition of becoming, you know, entrepreneurs in, in the fashion industry and making money and, you know, asking me like uh, business oriented questions and so on. But most of them were actually commenting any, you know, like a, a few of these questions explaining how they are trying to not consume, you know, and to, to not buy anything and to not... Uh, to, to, to clearly never go uh, into like uh, a regular store to buy a new product. So I was very struck by that uh, because again, you know, I was not in a, in a, in a, in a philanthropy oriented kind of class. Like it was really a business, uh, business um, group. So anyway, so, 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 to, so I guess maybe that's, that's a small part of an answer to your question. Um, from a brand's perspective, what, you know, what, what we see is clearly all of 
I think all of the major groups who used to be only focused on developing, um, you know, new products and, 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 and making money through like this regular kind of organization with new products are now investing in second hands, um, second hands businesses, you know, they do M&A and they buy like small or big or whatever or take uh, participations into uh, uh, these kind of companies uh, selling second hand. Uh, they do develop new services uh, to repair and to uh, so and and again I think it's like they have no choice you know and and and, and we actually did discuss that a bit in the class uh, two weeks ago and and I was making that comparison that came to my mind like when I used to work in the luxury business like uh, maybe fifteen years ago I remember when we started e-commerce. You know, there was this uh, impression and this fight in, in internally about, you know, at what if we do e-commerce, we're going to kill the stores, you know. And, but at some point, no choice, you know, like digital, you, 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 you need to, to offer your, your, your customers the service and the possibility to choose between going in a store or buying online. Well, same thing, I think, now. Uh, with um, second-hand uh, stuff. Like, you need to offer your customers the possibility to buy new or to buy, you know, second-hand or to, 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 to repair. Um, so anyway, and, and, but ob overall, uh, I think as well that um, you have a lot of businesses, you know, keeping, trying to improve in the quality of their products. And for me, that's another, you know, kind of, in a way, kind of answer to... Uh, to being fair and being careful about environment and so on, because when you're not about anything eph ephemeral, you know, it's 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 uh, when you think long term lives and so on, it's also, you know, depending on your perspective, but it ca it can also be one of a, a way to answer these uh, these needs. I, I'm worried that Chufi has not disagreed with anybody. <laughs> I know. Yes, exactly. No, I, I, I actually, I uh, maybe it's not disagree, but more so like the actual uh, notion that uh, you've that you've mentioned when you talked about uh, uh, folks that they are uh, buying uh, secondhand things. Uh, that's not necessarily like anti-capitalism, right? Because you said that uh, it's, 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 it could be uh, very well uh, in line. And I don't think any one of us that, that, that we are in any shape or form like anti-capitalism. And the reason why I say that is because uh, one of my uh, children uh, talks about some groups that they are, they call themselves anti-capitalism and they don't look like any one mm -hmm. of us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This way. So, yeah. so, so it's just, it's, uh, yeah, there's some extremists in the world that they just, just go against something. I think we have the opportunity to transition the world to a better capitalism, if you wish, or whatnot, mm. as opposed to mm. disrupt. Uh, I've been in disruptive technology pretty much all my life, and I can tell you with certainty there are a lot of capabilities of disrupting the current ways of living, and it's not nice. If you can't mm. transition, let's transition. A lot of bad things can happen in disruption. People, they talk about wars in Ukraine and everybody's talking about that, which my heart goes to Ukraine, don't get me wrong, but I think disruption can be drastic, a lot more drastic if we just suddenly let it manifest itself. And I think with efforts like this, and I'm glad Frank chose this topic because mm -hmm. we can brainstorm with a lot of other folks outside of this group, and whether together or separate, and how perhaps we can introduce some methods to transition into better capitalism as opposed to this shop because the disruption if we don't do anything about it it's coming it's so we better yeah. about it, it, yeah. it, it uh, sorry sorry i just want can i say just one point of the disruption point um and also kind of combining with something that mark said earlier um about kind of we talked about the boards and you know the investors and yeah, yeah. You know, I think there's also a real opportunity here with younger companies, with older companies, you know, they're quite difficult to gauge. But, you know, the arguments that they use around, well, we can't be diverse are, are actually kind of 
not actually true at this point in time because there are enough people with experience in all of those industries that are very diverse. If you look at consumer products, if you look at even oil and gas, you know, there's tons of people from all over the world who look very different, who've worked in these sectors forever. So there's no reason that there's not enough people there to participate. Younger companies, though, I think, like you said, how do we get them to do disruptive things, but not just just really destructive things, you know? Um, and I think that that's really the challenge, but there's an opportunity. They're much younger. So it is easier to influence them, to get them to maybe to adopt mm-hmm. some of the things that Chuki is discussing about, especially those that are working with AI. Um, so I think that there's some hope there um, for the next generation of companies that are coming along. Yeah, that's, that's, and look, guys, we've, we, could, I, we could probably discuss this for the next hour or two, to be honest, and we've got about two or so minutes left. There hasn't even been too many, if any, questions come through, but if I just use the next two minutes just to round this discussion off um, and just maybe on the sort of the topic of that too, if you sort of rightly correct, it's not about you know, bashing capitalism. It's not about you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. It's about how can we leverage capitalism for a better, as I sort of said at the start, a new, a new orthodoxy, a new version of it. So, yeah, if next, your final comments as we head into the last two minutes. Uh, maybe something with you, uh, Marie. Sorry? Any final comments, any final comments for you regarding this topic? Uh, well, uh, no, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sparking conversation is key. And if we want mm. to do, and I, I'm not sure we should speak about, I, I'm, I was going to say if we want to do a reset, but I'm not sure we want to do a reset. I think we are already embarked, you know, in, in a new era. But if we want to do, to keep, you know, embarking and to, 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 to clearly change things, um, it's, it's, it all starts with um, building awareness. So, so super, you know, always good to speak and to, to listen to, um, to different perspectives. Mm. But again, so I, I would just say I'm a firm believer for, you know, partnering, like working together. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, collaboration is the same. Yeah, yeah Tufi, any sort of final comments from you? I, I think uh, collaboration is uh, extremely important, cooperation and all of these things. In fact, uh, that marketplace that I've mentioned that is uh, hypercycle.ai, which is a uh, marketplace for AI engines, one of the things that it has that nobody else has in the world, it enables 40,000 engines to work together as opposed to only competing. Okay, that is super cool. Imagine you pick up the phone and talking to a bot, that bot subcontracts another bot in Italy who subcontracts another translator all in the sub-second thing. That's like so unprecedented. So I think we're seeing it uh, coming at so many different levels and, and I'm so glad that we were enhancing it at the, at the human level before it gets to the machine because a lot of the stuff that mm-hmm. uh, uh, Trista brought and, and, and Marie brought and, uh, you know, uh, they can be, uh, and of course, uh, Mark brought uh, from many different uh, perspectives uh, how we can start addressing them in the actual design because they cannot be addressed after the fact. So it's it's uh, super cool to see that coming. No, thanks, JB. Uh, Trista? Yeah, so I guess in closing, I would just say that, you know, um, I think there is hope in doing many of the things that we've discussed today, you know, really working particularly with younger companies to kind of really help them embrace these ideas so that they can kind of be built the right way. I think that's critical, right? If we look at the companies that are our largest companies today, a lot of them didn't even exist 15 or 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's possible the next 15 or 20 years, it will not be the same companies that we have today that are kind of running yeah. autonomous in many ways. So, um, so I think that there's opportunities, this kind of renovation and bringing new ideas, collaboration. Um, and certainly trying to kind of be, have more of a stakeholder view, as Marie mentioned in the beginning, um, of, of what value is and how, how our organization should work. Uh, thanks, Trista. And Mark, final comments for you, mate. Um, I would say travel responsibly. So, sorry, mm. my, my dog is on my lap. So one of my last trips <laughs> to Kenya, actually, uh, I was in a shopping center and found he, he was just this stray dog and Dog, stray dogs in Kenya last probably two years, maybe. So we mm. took him to the vets. We put notices up to make sure he wasn't anyone, and we brought him back to America. Um, mm. So I'm not wow. suggesting every time you travel, go adopt a dog. From <laughs> <laughs> but travel responsibly. Like it's like find out where you're going. Where what is what are the, sure. the again on the camera? Yes. 
Oh, cool. Very cool. Yeah. I, I remember in Kenya, they were posting that they lost their dog. Looks exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. No, no, no. We changed his hair color. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. Um, but, but research where you're going to stay, the hotel, the, the, the camp, you know, what their ethos is, how they impact the community. I think we all have so much opportunity to make change with the way we spend, especially when it comes to travel. So thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent point there, guys. I think, like, like I said before, I think we could have gone off another hour or two here and um, our session has completed. So look, really humbled to have been uh, part of this with you all. It's been a fantastic experience, too short in my view. Um, I thank Frank initially for you know, putting us all together in this important topic. I think it was probably the best one to be honest in this whole conference if I had one to pick, it would have been this one. So, again, thank you for your time today. I'd love to continue us offline somehow. Um, we'll see how we go. But, again, thanks for your time. Go to the Boston Red Sox. Thank <laughs> you. anyone who is in, guys, this uh, topic is awesome. And uh, yeah. kudos. Yeah. All the... Thanks so much. Yes, so yeah, important. Thanks. Stay safe. Take care. Yeah, yes, and yeah, it's, a bit, it's a very sensitive time in the world at the moment. So, you know, get around your loved ones. And, um, yeah, but thanks for your time, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Sean. Bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye, guys. Bye.